Chapter 9. After two years, I remember the rest of that day, and that night, and the next day, only as an endless drill of police and photographers and newspapermen in and out of Gatsby's front door. A rope stretched across the main gate, and a policeman by it kept out the curious. But little boys soon discovered that they could enter through my yard, and there were always a few of them clustered open mouth ab about the pool. So that refers back to um, the uh, Gatsby's death scene and Wilson's death scene, um, and kind of where that uh, where where the terrible stuff happened. Someone with a positive manner, perhaps a detective, used the expression madman as he, as he bent over Wilson's body that afternoon. And the adventitious authority of his, his voice set the key for the newspaper reports the next morning. Um, so we've got the idea of madman and Wilson together um, that we're putting together for the first time, considering the difference uh, between uh, how he was um, depicted in chapter two to now this is kind of the final. Most of the reports were a nightmare, grotesque, circumstantial, eager, and untrue. Um, and so we've got this idea of truth um, and, uh, and how things are explained after the fact. When Michali's testimony at the inquest brought to light Wilson's suspicions of his wife, I thought the whole tale would shortly be served up in a racy pasquinade, but Catherine, who might have said anything, didn't say a word. So here we know the truth, or at least Nick's truth, that this is um, the truth, but here we're hearing instead that, uh, that he's just a madman. She showed a surprising amount of character about it too. Um, notice that it's surprising for her to show character. Uh, looked, about, looked at the coroner with determined eyes and under that corrected brow of hers and swore that her sister had never seen Gatsby, that her sister was completely happy with her husband, that her sister had been in no mischief whatsoever. You'll notice this, uh, um, this anaphora here with the that her sister, that her sister, that her sister to, uh, to kind of re repeat and, uh, and kind of recreate Myrtle um, and change who she has been. Um, into someone who, uh, who will survive uh, the idea of, of who tells our story and kind of how we um, are remembered uh, is, is what's going on here. She convinced herself of it and cried into her handkerchief as if the very suggestion was more than she could endure. So Wilson was reduced to a man deranged by grief in order that the case might remain in its simplest form. Um, so I, the idea of people wanting simplicity. Um, so uh, so they're um, kind of also with the rumors about Gatsby, rather than the complexity of who he is, um, the easy explanations of as a spy or something like that. And it rested there. <clears throat> but this part of it seemed remote and unessential. So there's something more important going on. I found myself on Gatsby's side and alone. So we're thinking about how Nick's um, kind of feelings for Gatsby have gone um, up and then down and then up again. Um, you're better than, than all the rest put together. He was the worst thing ever. Um, and now we're back to Gatsby's side and him being the only one left. So we're thinking about like why Nick might, and that, that might be a character trait of Nick's, is why he might all of a sudden be interested there. <clears throat> From the moment I telephoned news of the catastrophe to West Egg Village, and so it is a catastrophe here, and uh, every surmise about him and every practical question was referred to me. All of a sudden, Nick is active, okay? Nick is kind of central to the story now, um, where he has not been before. At first, I was surprised and confused, um, as maybe we are also. Then, as he lay in his house and didn't move or breathe or speak, so here we've got some polysyndeton um, in order to kind of compound all of those things. Hour upon hour, it grew upon me that I was responsible because no one else was interested. Nice contrast of those two words, that when nobody else is interested, it creates responsibility for somebody who is. Interested, I mean, with, the in, with that intense personal interest to which everyone has some vague right at the end. Um, th this is kind of like a, a human right here that, uh, that we all have the, um, the, the right to have somebody care about us. I called up Daisy a half an hour after we found him, uh, which makes sense, right? Called her instinctively and without hesitation because she, he knows their, their connection. And so it makes perfect sense to call. But she and Tom had gone away early that afternoon and taken baggage with them. Left no, left no address? No. Say when they'd be back? No. Any idea where they are? How I could reach them? I don't know. Can't say. 
I wanted to get somebody for him. So these short sentences are really helpful here in, in reiterating the keys. I wanted to go into the room where he lay and reassure him. I'll get, to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'll get somebody for you, Gatsby. Don't worry, just trust me and I'll get somebody for you. Um, so here, giving Gatsby more in death maybe than Nick was willing to give him uh, um, in life, that he's here saying, hey, I, I am here for you. Um, and Nick has kind of been there, but, uh, but more in, in a you're pushing me around way rather than a voluntary way. Meyer Wolfsheim's name wasn't in the phone book. So here we've got, uh, we have Nick trying to get the important people in Gatsby's life. We've got Daisy and then we've got Meyer Wolfsheim. The butler gave me his office address on Broadway and I called information, but by the time I had the number, it was long after five and no one answered the phone. Will you ring it again? I've rung them three times. It's very important. Sorry, I'm afraid no one's there. I went back to the drawing room and thought for an instant that they, are, that they were chance visitors, all these official people who suddenly uh, filled it. So this, this, kind of, this idea of chance visitors, um, kind of like all of the party goers uh, throughout, um, but a very, very different scene here. But as they drew back the sheet and looked at Gatsby with unmoved eyes, his protest continued in my brain. So they don't care also. So just like the party goers, um, they are not moved by his death. Look here, old sport, you've got to get somebody for me. You've got to try hard. I can't go through this alone. And so here, and this is Nick imagining um, Gatsby's voice, so probably more about Nick and his feelings than it is about Gatsby himself. Someone started to ask me questions, but I broke away and going upstairs, looked hastily through the unlocked parts of his desk. He never told me definitely that his parents were dead. So that's our third important kind of uh, person or group of people for him. But there was nothing, only, uh, only the picture of Dan Cody, a token of forgotten violence staring down from the wall. And there, interesting that the part about Dan Cody that we're remembering now is the violence when most of what Gatsby remembered him for was kind of starting his career, right? And the, the, close, uh, the, the close relationship that they had. Next morning, I sent the butler to New York with a letter to Wolfsheim, which asked for information and urged him to come out on the next train. That request seemed su superfluous when I wrote it. I was sure he'd start when he saw the newspapers. So Nick has this idea of what, what is common decency and what people will do. Um, and so it's his own kind of values coming through there. Just as I was sure they, there would be a wire from Daisy before noon. So it seems like these things should be inevitable. But neither a wire nor Mr. Wolfsheim arrived. No one arrived except more police and photographers and newspaper men. And again, we have this kind of compounding effect of the polysyndicate. When the butler brought back Wolfsheim's answer, <clears throat> I began to have a feeling of defiance of scornful solidarity between Gatsby and me against them all. So again, we've got that idea of Gatsby, you're better than, than all the rest combined. And now Nick in kind of maybe being left out the whole time, um, they do have this solidarity that nobody's paying attention um, and Nick's the only one that can speak for him. Dear Mr. Carraway, this has been one of the most terrible shocks of my life to me. I can hardly believe that it is true at all. Such a mad act as this, uh, as that man did should make us all think. So again, he's thinking um, that, uh, that Wilson is mad also. Uh, I cannot come down right now as I am tied up in some very important business and cannot get mixed up in this thing right now. So the idea of mixed up in this thing, a little bit of criminality there and recognizing that, uh, that some things might draw too much attention. If there's anything I can do a little later, let me know by le in a letter by Edgar. I hardly know where I am when I hear about a thing like this and am completely knocked down and out. Yours truly, Meyer Wolfsheim. And then a hasty addenda beneath. Let me know about the funeral, etc. I do not know his family at all. So here we again get this idea that nobody really knows Gatsby well. Um, that even his closest... Um, friends like Nick in theory now, um, Meyer Wolfsheim, Daisy, that nobody really is connecting <coughs> with him at this moment. 
when the phone rang that afternoon and long distance said Chicago was calling. So we have that as a mirror from what happened during uh, um, Gatsby's party that Nick went to, the first one. Um, the idea of potentially, you know, uh, underground liquor, etc. I thought this would be Daisy at last because Daisy came from Chicago last. But the connection came through as a man's voice, very thin and far away. This is Slagle speaking. Yes, the name was unfamiliar. Hell of a note, isn't it? Get my wire. There haven't been any wires. Young Park's in trouble, he said rapidly. They picked him up They picked him up when he handed the bonds over the counter. They got a circular from New York giving him the numbers just five minutes before. What do you know about that? You can never tell in these hick towns. I love the idea of, of Chicago as a hick town. And so recognizing the difference between east and west here. Um, that the East is somehow, <coughs> excuse me, much more sophisticated. And even Chicago, um, which we would think of as a, as a major kind of um, cultural city, is a hick town. Hello, I interrupted breathlessly. Look here, this isn't Gatsby. Mr. Gatsby's dead. Um, one heck of a way to, to break that kind of news because clearly this person does not know that. He's talking about something terrible that Gatsby has to deal with in, uh, in his business. There was a long silence on the other end of the wire, followed by an exclamation, then a quick squawk as the connection was broken. So kind of like Wolfsheim can't get mixed up in this thing right now, right? I think it was on the third day that a telegram signed Henry C. Gatz arrived from a town in Minnesota. So now we've got uh, Gatsby's father, um, because remember he was James Gatz before. <clears throat> It was only that uh, it said only that the sender was leaving immediately and to postpone the, th the funeral until he came. It was Gatsby's father, a solemn old man. So here's where we get um, we get a lot of characterization um, for uh, um, for Gatsby's dad. Um, very helpless and dismayed, bundled up in a long, cheap ulster against the warm September day. His eyes leaked continuously with excitement. It's an odd word there for somebody who's grieving, who's lost their son. Um, that uh, and his eyes leaking rather than crying. We've seen that it's a that's relatively um, common usage. Um, but with excitement is obviously a little bit um, different from what we would expect. And when I took the bag and umbrella from his hands, he began to pull so incessantly at his sparse gray beard that I had difficulty in getting off his coat. He was on the point of collapse, so I took him into the music room and made him sit down while I sent for something to drink, something to eat. But he wouldn't eat, and the glass of milk spilled from his trembling hand. So we do have emotion here, um, and so he's we've got excitement um, and trembling. So is he like thrilled and anticipating something positive? Probably not. But there is a lot of emotion tied up in here. I saw it in the Chicago newspaper, he said. It was all in the Chicago newspaper. I started right away. I didn't know how to reach you. His eyes, seeing nothing, moved ceaselessly about the room. So here we've got this idea of um, his eyes again, which were leaking, um, but that they, they aren't seeing anything, even though they're moving all around. Um, so this idea of not understanding and comprehending. It was a madman, he said. He must have been mad. So reiterating this uh, this kind of sad um, word that gets, uh, that gets connected with Wilson at every, at every turn now. Would you like some coffee? I urged him. I don't want anything. I'm all right now, Mr. Caraway. Well, I'm all right now. Where have they got Jimmy? Oh, isn't this a beautiful diminutive term for, for Gatsby, James, G Jay Gatsby or Jim or James Gats. This one is much more familiar and loving, right? I took him into the drawing room where his son lay and left him there. Some little boys came up on the steps and were looking into the hall. And when I told him who had arrived, they went reluctantly away. So again, they're still gawking and looking for some sort of excitement. After a little while, Mr. Gatz opened the door and came out, his mouth ajar, his face flushed slightly, his eyes leaking isolated and unpunctual tears. Um, and so again, we've got this really cool image of his... Um, of his tears being somehow not the way uh, we would expect them to be punctual on time. Um, but they're not on time and they're kind of one at a time. 
He had reached an age where death uh, no longer has the quality of ghastly surprise. And when he looked around him now for the first time and saw the height and splendor of the hall and the great rooms opening out, of, out from it into other rooms, his grief began to be mixed with an awed pride. So we have this idea throughout this chapter of how people respond to death. And we've seen that um, that Daisy has kind of run away, even though she might not know that Gatsby's dead. We have Wolfsheim, who just can't be bothered with this right now. Um, and then we've got the father, who um, is, is older, so he's seen a lot of people die, um, so no longer has that quality of ghastly surprise, but also to, to recognize who he was um, before and appreciate the before death person rather than just the emotion of loss. I helped him to a bedroom upstairs where while he took off his coat and vest, I told him that all the arrangements had been deferred until he came. I didn't know what you'd want, Mr. Gatsby. Gats is my name. So again, a recognition of the change from Gats to Gatsby and really who is this and what's the difference between the two? Um, one kind of remote and, uh, and fancy and one very down to earth um, name. Mr. Gatz, I thought you might want to take the body west. He shook his head. Jimmy always liked it better down east. He rose up to his position in the east. So we've got this again, this contrast between east and west, um, where uh, where Jimmy or Gatsby wouldn't want to be, wouldn't want to go west, but rather the east is what's special to him. Um, so again, that that idea of kind of reaching toward his goals, and the east is what means something to him. We were close friends. I, I always find this a little bit ironic um, because they don't seem like close friends the, uh, throughout the time. And so now um, Nick seems to be connecting with Gatsby in a way that he hasn't throughout the whole book. He had a big future before him, you know. He was only a young man, but he had a lot of brain power here. He, he touched his head impressively, and I nodded. If he'd lived, he'd have been a great man, a man like J James G. Hill. He'd have, he'd have helped to build up the country. And again, this is irony also, because we know that what uh, Gatsby has been doing um, are relatively illegal uh, things rather than building up the country and railroads or something that's really kind of solid and, uh, and helping the country forward. That's true, I said uncomfortably, because Nick knows. He fumbled at the embroidered coverlet, trying to take it from the bed and lay down stiffly, was instantly asleep. That night, an obviously frightened person called up and demanded to know who I was before he'd give his name. This is Mr. Carraway. Oh, he sounded relieved. This is Clip Springer. So here we remember back to that boarder who was playing the piano when Daisy and Gatsby uh, um, were getting back together, etc. This guy who just kind of came to Gatsby's house and stayed, the boarder. He was relieved too, uh, for that seemed to promise another friend at Gatsby's grave. So again, so here's the fourth possibility for somebody, um, for a friend for Gatsby. I didn't want it to be in the papers and draw a sightseeing crowd because he knows that these are the types of people who have come to Gatsby's parties um, in the past. This idea of, of gossip and, uh, um, and rumor and, uh, and just pur purient interest. So I'd been calling up a few people myself. They were hard to find. Um, which feels a little bit sad to Nick, I think. The funeral's tomorrow, I said. Three o'clock here at the house. I wish you'd tell anybody who'd be interested. This idea, again, of interest in death that everybody has a right to. Um, oh, I will, he broke out hastily. Um, and so we notice, like, we don't feel a real kind of desperate interest there. Of course, I'm not likely to see anybody, but if I do. His tone made me suspicious. Of course, you'll be there yourself. Well, I'll certainly try. What I called up about is, wait a minute, I interrupted. How about saying you'll come? Well, the fact is, the truth of the matter is that I'm staying with some people up here in Greenwich and they rather expect me to be with them tomorrow. In fact, it's sort of a picnic or something. Of course, I'll do my very best to get away. So this idea that he's, uh, that now he's taking advantage of somebody else um, and can't be bothered with the person um, that let him live there for free essentially all summer. I ejaculated an unrestrained, huh? And he must have heard me, for he went on nervously. What I called up about was a pair of shoes I left there. I wonder if it'd be too much trouble to have the butler send them on. You see, they're my tennis shoes, and I'm sort of helpless without them. My address is care of BF. 
I didn't hear the rest of the name because I hung up the receiver. So Nick is clearly bothered by this, that again, it's just um, what Gatsby can do for other people that interests them, not the actual important kind of interest that he's looking for. After that, I felt a certain shame for Gatsby. One gentleman to whom I'd telephoned implied that, that, what he, that he had got what he deserved. However, that was my fault, for he was one of those who used to sneer most bitterly at Gatsby on the courage of Gatsby's liquor, and I should have known better than to call him. The morning of the funeral, I went up to New York to see Meyer Wolfsheim. I couldn't seem to reach him any other way. The door that I pushed open on the advice of, the ele of an elevator boy was marked the Swastika Holding Company. Notice this, um, we're, we're referring to Swastika um, before World War II, so it's not going to hold the same, uh, the, the same connotations, but it is interesting here. Um, a lot of people play with the fact that he's, uh, that he's a time traveler and knows things. Um, but here it's a symbol of luck, the swastika. And at first there didn't seem to be anyone inside. But when I'd shouted hello several times in vain, an argument broke out behind, the, behind a partition. And presently a lovely Jewess appeared at, the inter at an interior door and scrutinized me with black hostile eyes. So we kind of see this idea of Jewish people and a swastika holding company as ironic. But it would not have been. Um, to, uh, to um, Fitzgerald's original audience. Nobody's in, she said. Mr. Wolfsheim's gone to Chicago. This first part was obviously untrue, for someone had begun to whistle the rosary tunelessly inside. Please say that Mr. Carraway wants to see him. I can't get him back from Chicago, can I? At this moment, a voice, unmistakably Wolfsheim's, called Strella from the other side of the door. Leave your name on the desk, she said quickly. I'll give it to him when he gets back. But I know he's there. She took a step toward me and began to slide her hands indignantly up and down her hips. You young men think you can force your way in here any time, she scolded. We're getting sick and tired of it. When I say he's in Chicago, he's in Chicago. I mentioned Gatsby. Oh, she looked me over again. Will you just, what's your name? So we've got a shift here. Um, expectations versus uh, that, that she kind of expects somebody to be, um, to be looking for Wolfsheim that would not necessarily have um, a good interest at heart. She vanished. In a moment, Meyer Wolfsheim stood solemnly in the doorway, holding out both hands. He drew me into his office, remarking in a reverent voice that it was a sad time for us all. So a recognition kind of saying the right things. My memory goes back to when I first met him, he said, a young major just out of the army. So again, we're getting more history um, for Gatsby. So we need to make sure that we understand more of Gatsby's history. A young major just out of the army and covered over with the medals that he got, that he got in the war. So again, um, we're, we're getting confirmation of his, uh, his wartime exploits. He was so hard up. He had to keep on wearing his uniform because he couldn't buy some regular clothes. So we recognize that after the army, he was completely destitute. Um, and so now we kind of see his rise. The first time I saw him was when he came into Winter, Win, uh, Weinbrenner's pool room at 43rd Street and asked for a job. He hadn't eaten anything for a couple of days. Come on, have some lunch with me, I said. He ate more than $4 worth of food in a half an hour. Um, which $4 would have been a lot there. Did you start him in business? I inquired. Start him? I made him. So here um, we know uh, we know Wolfsheim's character as, um, as somebody who is uh, part of the underworld, and so he has brought Gatsby along with him. I raised him up out of nothing, right out of the gutter. I saw right away that he was a fine appearing. Notice that he's not a fine young man, but fine appearing. So this idea of appearances versus reality is uh, appearances um, continues. Gentlemen, gentlemanly young man. And when he told, told me he was in Oxford, I knew I could use him good. So respectability um, is something that, uh, that Wolfsheim can use. <coughs> I got him to join up in the American Legion, and he used to stand high there. Right off, he did some work for a client of mine up to Albany. We were so thick like that and everything. He held up two bulbous fingers, always together. So we do have a clear connection between the two. I wondered if this partnership had included the, the World Series transaction in 1919, uh, that big scandal, right? Um, now he's dead, I, uh, I said after a moment. You were his closest friend, so I know you'll come to his funeral this afternoon. So this idea of close friends, Nick trying to be his close friend when he wasn't his friend uh, in life, 
um, and trying to get these people uh, there. I'd like to come. We'll come then. The hair in his nostrils quivered slightly, so we've got, again got this, uh, this personification um, and this activeness of the nose that's so characteristic of um, Wolfsheim. And as he shook, to, shook his head, his eyes filled with tears. So we have some genuine emotion, um, and, and his nose shows it also. I can't do it. I can't get mixed up in it. So again, being mixed up, that death is somehow something to avoid. There's nothing to get mixed up in. It's all over now. When a man gets killed, I like to. Ne- I like. I never like to get mixed up in it anyway. I keep out. When I was a young man, I was. D- it was different. If a friend of mine died, no matter how, I stuck with them to the end. You may think that's sentimental, mental, but I mean it to the better, bitter end. So here we again get this uh, this difference of how people respond to death depending on age and experience. Nick is still relatively young. Remember, he just turned thirty, um, but uh, and and so he seems to be in this idea that um, that I stuck stuck with them to the to the end. Um, but now, uh, just like. Gatsby's dad, it's not shocking anymore. Um, And now he keeps out because there's potential negativity there. I saw that for some reason of his own, he was determined not to come. So I, so I stood up. Are you a college man? He inquired suddenly. For a moment, I thought he was going to suggest a connection, but he only nodded and shook my hand. Let us learn to show our friendship for a man when he is alive and not after he is dead. Um, So this is a little bit ironic um, that this is when Nick is showing his friendship (coughs) is only after he's dead. After that, my own rule is to let everything alone. So this idea of when is it most important to be there for somebody when they're alive um, or when they're dead, when they, when they can't see you anymore. Um, certainly lots and lots of interpretations here. And so we also consider um, some of the other texts that you've read and, uh, and, and those connections before and after death. When I left his office, the sky had turned dark and I got back to West Egg in a, in a drizzle. So again, we've got that mood um, set by weather. Um, after changing my clothes, I went next door and found Mr. Gatz walking up and down excitedly in the hall. So again, that excitement, his pride in his son and in his son's possessions, so not even in who he is, but in what he has, was continually increasing and now he had something to show me. Jimmy sent me this picture. He took out his wallet with trembling fingers. Again, those trembling fingers. To look here. So that's that emotion. It was a photograph of the house, cracked in the corners and dirty with many hands. So we've got the idea of the house being uh, being the important piece here um, as a representation of like of, of success and Gatsby. Uh, he pointed out every detail to me eagerly. Look there and then sought admiration from my eyes. He had shown it so often that I think uh, it was more real to him now than the house itself. So here he is, he's in the house, but it's the picture that he's pointing to. So again, kind of appearances and, uh, and, and kind of the details to share rather than living in the moment and, uh, and experiencing life. <clears throat> Jimmy sent it to me. I think it's a very pretty picture. It shows up well, very well. Had you seen him lately? He came out to see me two years ago and bought me the house I live in now. So we recognize some, uh, some generosity and the fact that even though he couldn't um, kind of accept his parents and his, uh, and his background for where he actually came from, he still seems to have uh, kept an emotional connection to his family. Of course, we was broke up when he run off from home, but now I see there was a reason for it. So this is an acceptable reason to make money and to get possessions. <clears throat> He knew he had a big future in front of him, and ever since he he made a success, he was very generous with me. He seemed reluctant to put away the picture, held it out for another minute, (laughs) lingeringly before my eyes. Then he returned the wallet and pulled from his pocket a ragged old copy uh, copy of a book called Hopalong Cassidy. Look here, he had, this is a book he had when he was a boy, it just shows you. He opened it to the back cover and turned it around for, uh, for me to see it. On the last uh, flyleaf was printed the word schedule and the date September 12th, 1906. So if Gatsby was, uh, was around 30, uh, this gives you an idea of how old he was. And underneath, and then we've got this schedule. This might remind you a little bit, um, at least it does for me, uh, of uh, um, 
of when we read um, the, the schedule of everything that Ben Franklin would do every day and try to get to perfection, right? This idea of no wasting time, um, no more smoking or chewing, this idea of moral perfection. <clears throat> um, and I wonder if it's moral perfection here or, uh, or success and what is, um, and, and really what does that say about, uh, about Gatsby and this idea? I come across this book by accident, said the old man. It just shows you, don't it? It just shows you, which is beautiful because it shows us that Gatsby has always been this thing. Jimmy was bound to get ahead. He always had some resolves like this or, or something. So here we're calling it resolves. Um, we've got the idea of Daisy and the green light and kind of all of his dreams and the idea of that romantic readiness and those promises of life. Um, and so how's he going to get to them? He does at least have an action plan. Did you notice what he's, uh, did you notice what he's got about improving his mind? He's all, he was always great for that. He told me I ate like a hog once and I beat him for it. So this idea of appearances again and that, um, that you have to um, kind of dress for the job you want is how we might say it. This idea of creating that persona and, not, um, and, not, and being who you want to be. He was reluctant to close the book, just like he was reluctant to put, put that picture away, reading each item aloud and then looking eagerly at me. I think he rather expected me to copy down the list for my own use, as if this is some sort of a recipe, right? A little, a little before three, the Lutheran minister arrived from Flushing, and I began to look involuntarily out the windows for other cars. So did Gatsby's father. And as the time passed, and the servants came in and stood waiting in the hall, his eyes began to bl blink anxiously, and he spoke of the rain in a worried, uncertain way. So we've got more emotion um, coming from him here slightly different emotions. The minister glanced several times at his watch, so I took him aside and asked him to wait a half an hour, but it wasn't any use. Nobody came. There's that short declarative sentence um, that might remind you, if you're thinking about unattended funerals, um, might make you think of Death of a Salesman and Willie Loman, right? Um, that nobody is coming to the funeral. And so you look at the difference between where Willie came from um, and where Gatsby came from, and you might have uh, a different expectation for um, people coming to the funeral. So I'd, I'd like you to kind of consider that, um, that obviously this is before um, uh, Willie, uh, Death of a Salesman, um, but might consider, you know, this idea of what does it mean um, to have that funeral and to have people there for you after your death. We've heard what Wolfsheim feels about that. At about five o'clock, our procession of three cars, um, so very small, reiterating the, the smallness of this funeral, reached the cemetery and stopped in a thick drizzle beside the gate. First a motor hearse, horribly black and wet, then Mr. Gatz and the minister and I in the limousine, and a little later, four or five servants and the postman from West Egg in Gatsby's station wagon, all wet to the skin. So we get, we've got this, this weather here. Um, and then we also have different types of cars. Um, we've got the limousine and then we've got the station wagon um, that, uh, that we've used. We've got Gatsby's cars. As we started through the gate into the cemetery, I heard a car stop and then the sound of someone splashing after us over the soggy ground. I looked around. It was the man with the owl-eyed glasses whom I had found marveling over Gatsby's books in the library one night three months before. So here we think about why owl eyes, this guy with the glasses, might show up. And we've repeated the word interest. Um, and true interest in what people deserve. And so this is a guy who wanted to see past the facade, wanted to kind of, um, to, to not just accept it blindly, but to think about it. And now here he is at the funeral. I'd, not, I'd never seen him since then. I don't know how he knew about the funeral or even his name. The rain poured down on his thick glasses, and we've got the idea of glasses. And he took them off and wiped them to see uh, the protecting canvas unrolled from Gatsby's graves. grave. So glasses, you know, we've got the idea of what somebody can see and can't see. Do glasses make him able to see people better? I tried to think about Gatsby then for a moment, but he was already too far away. And I could remember, uh, and I could only remember without resentment, that Daisy hadn't sent a message or a flower. So Daisy completely ignored um, this stuff. 
Dimly, I heard someone murmur, blessed are the dead that the rain falls on. And then the owl-eyed man said, amen to that in a brave voice. So he is never worried about trying to, to kind of connect um, and get mixed up in this business. We straggled down quickly through the rain to the cars. Owl Eye spoke to me by the gate. I couldn't get to the house, he remarked. Neither could anybody else. Go on, he started. Why, my God, they used to go there by the hundreds. So a recognition that all of these people are not there for Gatsby now. They were there only when he was useful. He took off his glasses and wiped them again, outside and in. That poor son of a bitch, he said. So again, that kind of sadness for him for seeming one way in life and then, uh, and then kind of being forgotten and neglected at the end. One of my most vivid memories is of coming back west. So here we've got east-west again, Whoever, uh, so we need to focus on the west. Um, one of my most vivid memories is coming back west from prep school and later from college at Christmas time. Those who went farther than Chicago would gather in the old dim Union Station at 6 o'clock of a December evening with a few Chicago friends already caught up in their own holiday gaieties to bid them a hasty goodbye. I remember the fur coats of, uh, of the girls returning from Miss This or That's and the chatter of frozen breath, so the details don't matter, and the ch chatter of frozen breath and the hands waving overhead as we caught sight of old acquaintances and the uh, matchings of invitations. Are you going to the Ordways, the Hershey's, the Schultz's? So these are Western names and kind of, again, um, the society there, um, but seems to be a little bit more intimate. And then the long green tickets clasped tight in our gloved hands. And the last murky yellow cars of, of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad looking cheerful as Christmas on the tracks, uh, as Christmas itself on the tracks beside the gate. We pulled in, out into the winter night and the real snow. Um, so here we've got reality out west. Um, our snow and began to stretch out beside us and twinkle against the windows and the dim lights of small Wisconsin stations moved by. The sharp wild brace came suddenly into the air. So here, his, his nostalgia um, is for kind of this, this warmth and, and beauty of the West, whereas when he got back from the war, he thought that it was uh, the ragged edge of nowhere. Um, so kind of experiences shifting how you feel about place. We drew in deep breaths of it as we walked back from dinner through cold vestibules, utterly aware of our identity with this country for one strange hour before we melted indistinguishably into it again. So identity with this country, um, West or overall, not sure, before we melted indistinguishably into it again. That, that, this idea of not being able to separate from place. That's my Middle West. Not the wheat or the prairies or the lost Swede towns, but the thrilling returning trains of my youth and the street lamps and sleigh bells in the frosty dark and the shadows of holly wreaths thrown by lighted windows in the snow. All warmth, not the, the concrete um, idea, but the idea of home. Oops. I am part of that. A little solemn with the feel of those long winters, a little complacent from growing up in the Caraway house in a city where dwellings are still called through the decades by the family's, by a family's name. So here you've got a little bit more concrete history where, the, where people stay rather than kind of the, the speed of what goes on in the East. Um, <clears throat> I see now that this has been a story of the West after all. Tom and Gatsby, Daisy and Jordan and I were all Westerners. And perhaps we possessed some deficiency in common which made us subtly unadaptable to Eastern life. So they were not able to fit in. Um, that something about them didn't work and maybe it's their Westernness. Even when the East excited me most, so we've got that idea of excitement and that's how uh, Gatch was, was he was excited, like there was newness and, and freshness. Even when I was most keenly aware of its superiority to the bored, sprawling, swollen towns beyond the Ohio, with their interminable inquisitions, which spared only the children and the very old, even then it had always held it, it had always for me the quality of distortion, um, that it's not quite real, that uh, that how we see it or something like that, that it's distorted. West Egg especially still figures in my more fantastic dreams. I see it as a night 
night scene by El Greco. Um, nice allusion to, um, you, you might want to, to look up some El Greco paintings um, to kind of see the, the nature of what he's talking about. A hundred houses, at once conventional and grotesque. So we're connecting those two words with an and, um, but they are very, they're very different um, words. So we've got a contrast there. Crouching under a sullen overhanging sky and lusterless moon, um, different from Gatsby's moon that first night. In the foreground, four solemn men in dress suits are walking along the sidewalk with a stretcher on which lies a drunken woman in a white evening dress. A little bit of contrast there too. Her hand, which dangles over the side, sparkles with cold jewels. Gravely, the men turn in at, the, at a house, the wrong house but no one knows the woman's name and no one cares. So this is the, the idea of West Egg, um, is that there's tragedy and nobody even cares. Um, and, and it gets kind of missed with all the excitement that exists. After Gatsby's death, the East was haunted for me like that, distorted beyond my, pow my eye's power of correction. So there's that I idea of distortion again. So when the blue smoke of brittle leaves was in the air and the wind blew the wet, stiff laundry on the line, I decided to come back home. So that's a description of, of fall, of autumn. There was one thing left to be done before I left, an awkward, unpleasant thing that perhaps had better been left, had, uh, let, let alone. So this idea of an unpleasant thing, awkward, unpleasant thing, we know that that's something that Nick tends to avoid. But I wanted to leave things in order, which is different from how he was at the beginning, and not just trust that obliging and indifferent sea to sweep my refuse away. Um, and so this idea that uh, the, the things in his wake, that can go back to chapter one, that idea of Gatsby. I saw Jordan Baker and talked over and around what had happened to us together and what had happened afterward to me. And she lay perfectly still, listening in a big chair. So this, this is also how she was in chapter one. She was dressed to play golf. And I remember thinking she looked like a good illustration. Her chin raised a little jauntily. That's a word that we often see with her and her chin from the first chapter. The, uh, her hair, the color of an autumn leaf. Her face, the same brown tint as the fingerless glove on her knee. When I had finished, she told me without comment that she was engaged to another man. I doubted that, though there were several she could have been she could have married at the nod of her head. But I pretended to be surprised. So again, she needs. To, this is kind of a sa uh, a way to save face. Is I'm getting uh, engaged to somebody else. I'm uh, that uh, that it makes this a little bit less personal and a little less painful uh, breakup. For just a minute, I wondered if I wasn't making a mistake. Then I thought uh, thought it all over again quickly and got up to say goodbye. So they're done. Jordan and Nick are done. Nevertheless, you did throw me over, said Jordan suddenly. You threw me over on the telephone. I don't give a damn about you now, but it was a new experience for me. And I felt a little dizzy for a while. So this idea of, um, of uh, things that she's not used to, it's okay for her to be careless um, as long as there are not other careless people around. And it's okay for her to be um, kind of hostile and kind of throw people over as long as it doesn't happen to her. We shook hands. Oh, and do you remember, she added, a conversation we once had about driving a car? Why, not exactly. That's the carelessness stuff. You said that a bad driver was only safe until she met another bad driver? Well, I met another bad driver, didn't I? Um, so she's talking about Nick. I mean, it was careless of me to think to, uh, me to make such a wrong guess. I thought you were, a, you were rather an honest, straightforward person. I thought it was your secret pride. And this was exactly what Nick said, is that uh, he's one of the few honest people that he's ever known. I'm 30, I said. I'm five years too old to lie uh, to myself and call it honor. So here he's recognizing, and maybe it's the age, um, but that he was kind of lying to himself in, uh, in previous times. Um, but now that's no longer honorable, being more, uh, more kind of focused um, on reality as he moves forward. She didn't answer. Angry and half in love with her and tremendously sorry, I turned away. Love those conflicting emotions. One afternoon, late in October, I saw Tom Buchanan. So we've got this, uh, this shift here um, where we've got a, a shift in time. Um, and so now we get back to the Buchanans. He was walking ahead of me along Fifth Avenue. So we're back in New York um, in his alert, aggressive way. Um, so this is in October, probably before, before Nick has uh, left and gone back west. 
his hands a little out from his body as if to fight off interference, his head moving sharply here and there, adapting itself to his restless eyes, all those things that we've heard about him all throughout. Just as I slowed up to avoid overtaking him, he stopped and began frowning into the windows of a jewelry store. Sudden, so, he, so Nick's trying to avoid. Um, suddenly he saw me and walked back, holding out his hands. What's the matter, Nick? Do you object to shaking hands with me? Yes, you know what I think of you. Um, I wonder if he does know. You're crazy, Nick, he said quickly. Crazy as hell. I don't know what's the matter with you. Tom, I inquired, Why did you, what did you say to Wilson that afternoon? Um, so this idea that, uh, that Wilson somehow knew um, that it was Gatsby who was in the car. He stared at me without a word, and I knew I had guessed right about those missing hours. Um, so, uh, so it was Tom that told, uh, um, told uh, Wilson where to find um, Gatsby. So really, he's responsible for the death in theory. I started to turn away, but he took, another, took a step after me and grabbed my arm. I told him the truth, he said. He came to my door while we were getting ready to leave. And when I sent down, uh, sent down word that we weren't in, he tried to force his way upstairs. He was crazy enough to kill me if I hadn't told him who owned the car. And really, it, it is... It, Tom that he would have wanted to kill because that's who Myrtle was having an affair with. Um, it's just this idea of the car that becomes uh, the problem here. His hand was on a revolver in his pocket. Every minute he was in the house, he broke off defiantly. What if I did tell him? That fellow had it coming to him. He threw dust in your eyes, just like he did in Daisy's, but he was a tough one. He ran over Myrtle like you'd run over a dog and never even stopped his car. So even Tom thinks that it was Gatsby and not Daisy um, that, uh, that ran over Myrtle. Um, so not a lot of truth there. There was nothing I could say except, one, uh, except the one unutterable fact that it wasn't true. Um, right. And if you didn't, uh, and if you think I didn't get, have my share of suffering, look here. When I went to give up that flat, um, that's the apartment in the city, and saw that damn box of dog biscuits sitting there on the sideboard, I sat down and cried like a baby. By God, it was awful. So we do have a little bit of heart, a little bit of feeling and sentimentality for Tom that he's not just like, and, and just like in chapter seven, he was genuinely hurt by, uh, by Myrtle's death. I couldn't forgive him or like him. But I saw that what he had, uh, he had done was, to him, entirely justified. It was all very careless and confused. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed uh, up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess they had made. This is a really key idea, um, that money allows carelessness to happen without consequence, um, that you can spa smash things up and run away. I shook hands with him. It seemed silly not to, for I suddenly felt as if I were talking to a child. Then he went into the jewelry store to buy a pearl necklace. Ooh, just like the one uh, that he got for Daisy for the wedding. Or perhaps only a pair of cuff buttons. Rid of my provincial, provincial squeamishness forever. This idea of provincial squeamishness, this is a kind of a Western thing. Um, now he is sophisticated and understands the world. Gatsby's house was still empty when I left. The grass on his lawn had grown, had grown as long as mine. One of the taxi drivers in the village never took a fare uh, past the entrance gate without stopping for a minute and pointing inside. Perhaps it was he who drove Daisy and Gatsby over to East Egg the night of the accident, and perhaps he had made a story about it all of his own. I didn't want to hear it, and I avoided him when I got off the train. I spent my Saturday nights in New York uh, because those d gleaming, dazzling parties of his uh, were with me so vividly that I could still hear the music and the laughter faint and incessant, incessant from his garden and the cars going up and down the drive. One night I did hear a material car there and saw its lights stop at the front steps, but I didn't investigate. Probably it was some final guest who had been away at the ends of the earth and didn't know that the party was over. Beautiful use of this phrase, um, not just Gatsby's parties, but all of the fun and excitement, etc. 
On, that la on the last night, with my trunk packed and my car sold to the grocer, I went over and looked at that huge, incoherent failure of a house once more. So here's his house again. On the white steps was an obscene word, crawl, uh, scrawled by a boy with a piece of brick, stood out clearly in the moonlight, and I erased it. Um, so again, he's there for Gatsby at the end, drawing my shoe ras raspingly along the stone. Then I wandered down to the beach and sprawled out on the sand. Most of the big shore places were closed now, <coughs> and there were hardly any any lights except the shadowy moving glow of the ferry boat across the sound. So here we've got the end of the season. Um, and as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for the Dutch sailor's eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. Its vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate with to his capacity for wonder. So this idea of exploration and coming to something new um, that the first time anybody saw the, the shore of, uh, of New England and, and how wondrous it was then and now that's all kind of been pushed away and it's all used up almost um, and kind of left abandoned um, these closed uh, these closed houses and as I sat there brooding on the old uh, unknown world I thought of Gatsby's wonder so Gatsby is one who never lost that wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock he had come a long, uh, a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could f hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him. Oh, that's a beautiful idea, right? That his dream was already behind him, um, even though uh, he was there to try to get it. Somewhere back at that vast obscurity beyond the city where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night, that's the West. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgiastic, orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It's receding and before us. That's, uh, um, that's uh, paradoxical. Um, it eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch our arms farther, and one fine morning, and then we leave that kind of unsaid. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. One of the key quotes for this, uh, for this idea. So the idea um, that the current is going one way and the boat would be going that way also, but that we are trying to go back into the past. Um, and, uh, and so we are um, Born back ceaselessly into the past, even though we're trying to go for we're trying to go forward, um, but we're always going back into the past. Um, is that beautiful idea that we're left with? <laughs>